This week on Q&A, part two of our look at an upcoming book by Douglas Brinkley. It's about Theodore Roosevelt and the early days of the conservation movement. In last week's installment, Mr. Brinkley talked about the genesis of his interest in the subject. And what interests me as writing a book like The Wilderness Warrior is Roosevelt really is the father of U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Uh, if John Muir is known as the creator of the Sierra Club, it's Roosevelt that realized that the federal government has an obligation to save species of birds and animals, that to save um, plants and trees, and to um, be the, the president has an obligation to make sure that we put aside for generations unborn natural wonders like Roosevelt did, like uh, you know the Grand Canyon or Mount Olympus or the Petrified Forest. And they turned this training center for conservation into a museum almost for Theodore Roosevelt. That training center is the National Conservation Training Center, one of the many places Doug Brinkley went to research his book. Steve Chase, we talked about the eagle's nest in our discussion with Doug Brinkley about his book on conservation. It's right over your shoulder there. When did that start? Well, about five years ago, we had a pair of bald eagles that came in and started trying to build a nest. First season, they didn't do a very good job. Uh, but the second season, they came back, tried again, and they succeeded in building that nest. Um, they had two eaglets that year. One of them died, and the other one fledged out. What does um, this have to do with the business you're in? Well, uh, until very recently, the American bald eagle was an endangered species. And it's because of work by the Fish and Wildlife Service and by many other conservation groups that it was actually taken off the endangered species list about a year ago. Uh, so it's a good, I think it's a, a good model for us to aspire to where critters that were almost gone off the face of the earth have come back. Mark Madison, why do you do this job here as a historian? Well, I'm an environmental historian, so the, the dream for me was to actually work in a history job where you could make a difference. So I help teach a lot of biologists that go to work in the field. The displays here are seen by about 15,000 students a year uh, who go out and carry out conservation. So I, I feel like my history is making a difference. We know that that eagle's nest is seen by people all over the United States and the world because they can see it on the web. Does that do anything for you and the kind of work you're doing? Does it bring anybody to your, <laughs> your telephone to want to know what's going on in history? Well, we have a pretty good history website up. We have a uh, Fish and Wildlife Service uh, history website, and we get a lot of phone calls there. We put up oral histories. We put up uh, pictures of artifacts. We even put up whole historic books, and a lot of people come asking for images for books, for films they might be doing, for dissertations. Uh, so we get a lot of traffic on the web. Steve Chase, give us the background on how this institution got here, where it is in the country, who supports it, who pays for it. We're located uh, about 80 miles northwest of Washington, D.C., here in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. And until this place was built, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service did its training mostly at your typical airport Hilton or airport Holiday Inn. And when we started to design this place, we looked to build it as a place that the people in the Fish and Wildlife Service could call home and a place that would represent the importance the uh, service puts into investing into its employees. We have really talented, really dedicated folks to work for the Fish and Wildlife Service, but it's really critical that they continue to uh, build their skills so they can do a better job to deal with the really complex um, conservation challenges that we face today and that we'll face in the future. Mark Madison, how much does this cost and who paid for it? Steve would have to answer that. <laughs> this place costs about $150 million for everything that we see here. Who in Congress was responsible for it? Uh, Senator Robert C. Byrd made sure that uh, we had the funding necessary to build the place, but both uh, the first Bush administration and the Clinton administration requested funds for the project and supported the project. And how many buildings are here? We have about 17 buildings on about 540 acres. And how long did it take for it to be built? Yeah, it took us about three years. What can a book like Doug Brinkley's writing about conservation and about Theodore Roosevelt do for the kind of work you do? 
it can do a lot. First, it can help our employees enjoy more of an esprit de corps and recognize their own heritage. It helps the American public realize that just like a Mona Lisa or any other historic artifact, these parks and refuges really are a rare and precious heritage item. Uh, and it helps us explain to the public what we do. A lot of us give little talks at refuges or parks or schools that last for an hour or so. It's really useful if we can turn them over to a, a substantive history book like Doug's if they want to know more about that history. So your it's back, invaluable. Your background, I know you graduated from Harvard. What year? I graduated from Harvard in 1989 with a Ph.D. in history of science. And how long have you been here? I've been here 10 years. This is my 10th anniversary, and it's the best place I've ever worked. I worked as a professor at Harvard and Australia, um, but here I feel like I'm, I'm doing history in the field, basically, and it's, it's a great place. Steve Chase, your background? Mm -hmm. uh, I have a master's in public administration from the Barney School in Hartford, and worked a lot of different jobs in environmental education, the outdoor business, and uh, public government and came into the Fish and Wildlife Service as a presidential management intern in 1990 and started in D.C. and then this project came along and I was able to jump in right at the very start of it. I was on the planning team, did a lot of the operational planning as well and was uh, privileged enough to be able to watch this place rise from an old farm in West Virginia to uh, probably uh, one of the greatest uh, conservation training locations on on the planet. There are a lot of archives in this country, and this one is devoted to fish and wildlife. Um, how important are they to a historian's research? This is ground zero for anybody wanting to deal with the issues of wildlife protection, because in these file cabinets here, in the samples that they have, in the taxidermy here, in the maps, this is how wild America got saved. So you can go and look at the old documents from what was called the Biological Survey, which later became U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and you could track all over the country all different kinds of species. If you wanted to really learn about gray wolves or you wanted to learn about manatees, this would be a, a place to come and start finding how the protection movement got um, underfoot. One of the people you write a lot about in your book is John Burroughs, and behind you is a old picture of him and Theodore Roosevelt. Who was he? John Burroughs is a great American. Uh, he was a transcendentalist. Um, he was taken under the wing of Walt Whitman during the Civil War when Whitman was a nurse with soldiers. And he became, Whitman tapped him for greatness. And he had a, an incredible mind as a naturalist, as a poet, as a writer. And he was the most popular person writing on nature after the Civil War. So we're talking about millions of copies of his books sold. So he, he's a direct descendant of that Emerson, Thoreau, Whitman school, and T.R. admired him more than any single person. When I read all Roosevelt's correspondence, he usually calls people by their first name or last name. For, for John Burroughs, it's Um John, Dutch for uncle. And he, he felt adopted by John Burroughs. And Roosevelt wanted to be Burroughs in his writing. And he, he, he thanks him in all of his books. He even, in, in one of them, puts a letter of tribute of the greatest American as Burroughs. He was a person who lived up in the Catskills, our great Catskills naturalist, and would write about his backyard, about a bluebird building a nest, or about uh, how a river flows, or about uh, you know clouds drifting. And it was nature in your backyard. John Muir out in California was the grandeur of Alaska and California. Burroughs said, you've got a universe in your backyard. It's sort of that Whitman school. In a blade of grass, you can learn a lot about nature. And a brilliant writer, I've been working hard to, uh, with the Burroughs Foundation up in New York to try to make sure all of his homes get preserved. And Library of America does the books of the great writers, the Faulkner and F. Scott Fitzgerald, Willa Cather, et cetera. Burroughs belongs in that top tier. I would say he's one of the top 20 writers we've ever had, and in my opinion, the finest naturalist writer in the United States. T. 
T.R. loved him as president. He had Burroughs come with him out to Yellowstone. Uh, they went hiking and camping together. Uh, he brought Burroughs on that trip out west. And when Roosevelt would spend time in Pine Knot outside of Charlottesville, it was only for his wife and kids. And the only guest he would have in his country home was John Burroughs. And they would go uh, bird watching. And their correspondence is largely about what they're each seeing. Um, there's no higher compliment to Theodore Roosevelt than that John Burroughs thought that Roosevelt's best writing wasn't just about hunting, but was about preservation. You had a very personal note in there about John Burroughs, and you said that he loved Walt Whitman. Then in a parenthetical expression, you said there's no evidence that they had a homosexual relationship. What, yes. Why did you need to write that? Oh, well, because Walt Whitman was, was gay, and during the Civil War, um, Whitman literally adopted John Burroughs. Um, Burroughs, uh, you can't tell by the, the, with the beard there, when he was a young man, he had these extraordinary matinee idol looks and they basically have love notes to each other. Um, he became the great student of Walt Whitman. Whitman could have picked anybody. It was Burroughs, and yet their, their relationship was one of a platonic nature, and, uh, but he became Burroughs almost a son to Walt Whitman. All right, we're in this archive facility here at the National Center, uh, Conservation Center for Training. How much time did you spend in this room? Um, I would come down here. I didn't spend that much time in this room. This is a place where they uh, keep the artifacts, you know, so we're getting special access, although Mark Madison, the historian, would come and show me items here, which really informed my writing. Uh, for example, behind me there's a bag that says um, biological survey poison, and there was a period of time when the biological survey's job was to do pest control and predator control so farmers wouldn't lose livestock with wolves. On the other side of that mission was farmers would sometimes just shoot birds willy-nilly. And it's the biological survey that was, which is U.S. Fish and Wildlife, that said, no, you've got to keep the birds. They're eating the mosquitoes. They're controlling the insects. They're controlling the pestilence. And much of the period I'm writing about with Sea Heart Miriam, the biological survey, is putting out information for farmers on why um, wildlife is important to keep on your farm, that you don't want to get rid of birds, that you want to attract birds. Remember, scarecrows are always about birds not eating, and you think farmers don't want birds. But the sophistication started coming, uh, and also in issues of soil erosion and the role different animals can play into helping an ecosystem stay alive, um, and with issues of forest, forest deforestation. I don't think people in America, or, and I certainly didn't, Brian, when I started this, realize how serious trees are. I mean, if you lose trees in this country, you lose everything. You'll have no farm out from, you get soil erosion, you'll have runoffs, you'll have problems with every part of growing produce if you're not keeping far. So Theodore Roosevelt as president would build, plant trees like in Nebraska to also help with wind. You know, when, if a farmer's going to do corn, a windstorm would kill the corn. Now we have shorter hybrid corn due to Norman Borlaug and the Green Revolution, et cetera. But back then, you had to have trees around the corn. You had to keep a forest around it just to, you know, blunt when so U.S. Fish and Wildlife wasn't just about um, bag limits and you know monitoring wildlife refuge and protecting animals. It was also had a mission of helping farmers and people living out in the wild um, co coexist with nature in a way that was both economical, utilitarian, and aesthetic. So go back to the first time you thought about coming to this facility. How did it happen? Where did you find out that it even existed? Well, I wanted to begin my book with the birth of the 51 federal bird reservations TR created. And the first one is called Pelican Island, Florida. And I went to Pelican Island, Florida. It's near Vero Beach. And I went out on a uh, boat. I went to the island, which is a bird refuge. You can't walk on it because the bird, you could step on bird's nest. Uh, the, the island, for example, and there are many like this off our coast, but Pelican Island, for example, pelicans would come, and they would they would breed uh, in in um, you know nest there, and so they'd all be in a cluster. But the Millinery Institute, women's fashion during the Gilded Age, for example, wanted feathers for women's um, caps. They wanted uh, for, you know egret feather or a heron feather, etc. And so people would come and just gun them all down, and you were massacring birds. They would be heaps of dead birds just for a feather. And we were losing species in Florida. Wild Florida, I mean, you think that the West was wild? 
Florida was the last untamed place down around the swamps of the Everglades and in places. These were a lot of ex-Confederates on the land, people that couldn't stand the federal government with Civil War memories. And their view was, if it's a bird, I'll shoot it. There's money to be had. Roosevelt's first place is, is in 1903 in March is Pelican Island, Florida. And what happened is, and we've got these here, this is, these are 1902 surveys of Pelican Island, which is like a dollop of land, you know, a little island, but it was an incredible pelican and, and other species, but mainly pelican resting area. And so this kind of information, these documents here are talking about the bird life, and it's the first mapping really we had of this part of wild Florida. These ornithologists that were friends of Roosevelt, and a man named Frank Chapman in particular, uh, who I write about quite a bit in my book, but others, uh, William Dutcher being prominent, but they then eventually got to TR, who was a fellow birder and an ornithologist, and said, You've got, we're going to lose the birds of Florida if you don't do anything. Roosevelt said, uh, looked into it a little, and then famously said, is there anything to stop me? I so declare it a federal bird reservation, and just grabbed Pelican Island. And it was the first time ever that land was set aside to be run and controlled by a species. Before that, you had like a Yellowstone, where, but it was for people. This was off limits. There were signs, no trespassing. And um, so these types of documents are here, not in Florida, although I could go to the island, look at the birds, talk to people. So I had to come here to see documents like this. Here is the man. If you go down to Sebastian, Florida, there's a statue of him down in Florida. And there, his home is right there. Paul Craigle grew up in Germany and he loved storks because you weren't allowed to kill storks when they're in your chimneys because it was bad luck to kill a stork in, in Northern Europe. The famous Hans Christian Andersen folktale about the storks and babies were brought by storks. He came over to the United States, first to New York, then Chicago, and as a teenager arrived down there in Florida, right across from Pelican Island where TR saved. And he saw these people slaughtering the birds and Paul Craigle started independently taking a shotgun and pointing it at people who would dare to approach to slaughter these birds. He became the pelican watcher. He was considered a bit of a kook um, because he cared about pelicans so much. But TR heard about him, he was a legendary person, and he became the first game warden in Florida to stop what was known, Brian, as the feather wars. Roosevelt's game wardens, out of his first four USDA, Department of Agriculture, federal government wardens, you know, two of them are murdered down there. Uh, I write about the murder of particularly of, of Guy um, Bradley in my book, but there's two meaning, these are, here's the first guys TR is putting and two are killed because there was like a feather mafia going on in the industry here for women's fashion. Craigle stays on the job and he was so proud. I went and I didn't uh, unfortunately get to put this in my footnotes of my book because for uh, length reasons, but I went to his ancestors' homes in Florida and they showed me his first badge, Theodore Roosevelt's badge he gave him to be as a warden, and his shotgun, double-barreled shotgun. He pointed anybody approaching these birds. TR dies, Theodore Roosevelt died in, in, um, in 1919, January, and he lived on in the 20s. And this is not apocryphal, Warren Harding, comes down on a yacht by Pelican Island, and that Roosevelt said nobody's allowed to even set foot on Pelican Island. Harding and his yacht guys are playing cards, and they're going on a golfing trip in Florida in the 1920s. He's President Harding. They approach Pelican Island. He comes out of them at his boat. He was a boat maker. He made his own boat and pointed a gun at the President of the United States and said, I'm Roosevelt's warden. TR was already dead. Get out of here. And he turned Harding and those guys back. Um, the point is, conservation in the beginning of the 20th century was a battle. There were two sides to it, just like there are now on land issues. Should you drill in Anwar or not drill? It was nasty in Florida. And not only did he create Pelican Island in 1903 TR, but he created a string of pearl strategy of, of bird refuges all the way down Florida. And if you grab a map and you see all of them, it was TR saving them. And we would not have these species living in Florida. We would have lost wild Florida forever if Roosevelt didn't act when he did. He had spent time in Florida as a rough rider in Tampa Bay on his way to go to fight in Cuba. And here he is getting ready 
for battle and was taking notes on birds of the Tampa Bay area. And so places like around Sanibel Island, which is a beautiful place, a lot on the Gulf Coast of Florida he saved, and most famously uh, Key West, the dry tortugas, which were great bird breeding places. Oh, say, go back, go back to uh, the beginning. How did you find this place? Well, that was it. I found when I would start going to the spots, they all say, did you go here, the okay. headquarters? So then I, I'm actually basically asking you these questions for others that yeah. need to research. How did then did you get in the door? Called um, Mark Madison, who's the historian for U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and part of his job is to interface with scholars. And uh, they've helped me to particularly um, beyond looking at material, but with these, with slides, like I was talking about. Um, these are the old lantern slides. There's a box of them, Brian. I don't know if you're going to be able to see this. There, but well, the whole box. There's Craigle, like for I don't know if you can see it, but maybe we can get an image put up. But that's Craigle in a canoe down there. They've got all of the battles of Oregon and Washington State um, that Tierra. They have slides and of Florida of these early Warrens and conservationists. We may not know the people listening who this guy is, Paul Craigle, in U.S. Fish and Wildlife culture. He's a hero. He's known all over. And as I said, he's got a whole monument down there in Florida. In fact, the singer Arlo Guthrie moved to be near to be near where his house was in this Florida movement to save manatees, et cetera. Okay, so you call Mark Madison. Uh... Come, come here or come to any of these places. I've been to the ones at Yellowstone, Yosemite, other ones too. And you come and do research and come here and try to look at... Uh, documents, books and things I pretty much had, but they can find this kind of material. And also, to check with them, even today before we were talking, I was asking them, they have the up-to-date numbers here on species I'm writing about. For example, it's a Louisiana, behind us, Louisiana black bear, or Louisiana bear. It's a subspecies of black bear, and it's almost extinct. There are only 200 and some left in the um, Tensaw River region of Louisiana, Mississippi up there near Arkansas. And so we, this particular bear, people don't even know, but there are only 250 approximately left in the United States. I mean, that are alive. Alive, that's it. We're about to lose the Louisiana a black bear. There are only 250 alive. But here at Fish, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, they're going down to Louisiana and creating reserves for them. And the people of Louisiana who used to hunt them, in, including Theodore Roosevelt, their local communities, I was speaking in Monroe, Louisiana, they want to save the Louisiana black bear. People are very proud now of their bear history. In fact, William Faulkner in Mississippi famously wrote the short story, The Bear, about, um, modeled loosely on a man named Holt Collier, who was a bear hunter in uh, Ben Lilly. There are these legendary bear people down there in the Delta. Um, but that we've almost, due to mass agriculture, over hunting, harvesting, uh, killing bears because they were considered predators. Uh, we've almost destroyed them. But here is where they're rehabilitating him. Well, TR went and spent time and wrote about the Tennessee um, River region in great detail. So I had what TR thought about it, but for, to inform my book, I needed to ask them what's going on there today. What were the black bear populations like back then that the biological survey had, and what are they like today? And so with different species, when I was writing about, this is the place I had to come to, to check. So when you come in a place like this, how long do you spend here, and what do you do while you're here? Look at documents, look at books. I mean, to be honest, one of the most helpful things is, is not in this room, but out there, they have a library. In fact, a minute ago, they just gave me two titles that I didn't know about for perhaps future writing of, of mine because they're collecting everything here. I mean, I just noticed a minute ago behind in this cabinet, I never saw, unfortunately, this little book by C.B. Colby on the history of fish and wildlife. And they've got all these pamphlets, documents, photos. Uh, it's a great archive, but the problem with the, I, I, why, why I'm kind of feeling I'm walking into a treasure trove is a lot of people writing on nature focus on national parks only. Nature of them is the Grand Canyon, Yellowstone, Yosemite, the Great Smoky Mountains. Which is, to, which is a, um, the Park Service. Ken Burns in the fall is doing the National Parks. People don't know enough about what U.S. Fish and Wildlife does, and that's what Roosevelt cared the most about, more than the parks, was how to save species and their habitats. Because if you don't have enough wetlands, you can't have the species. And so they monitor everything here. For example, Fish and Wildlife declared, helped declare the Florida panther an endangered species. 
And now, um, there many of them are getting hit by cars, modernity, uh, uh, making it very hard for them to survive. But So our government's created a national wildlife refuge on their Roosevelt way of thinking. Let's create a habitat so this panther can live. We're not saying there are going to be a million of them, but we should not lose the, the Florida panther. We should not lose our jaguars along New Mexico and Arizona. And uh, we should not lose the polar bear in, in Alaska. This is where they're fighting for species survival. This is where the Endangered Species Act is real. These are the people at Fish and Wildlife that are out there on the ground. And, and, uh, and so my book isn't just about Theodore Roosevelt. It's about how we got to where uh, this triumphal story, if you like. We do have a great system. Look at the map that we've got. The problem we have is we're, we're not maintenancing properly due to not enough funding our wildlife refuge system. And commercialization's always encroaching on these. People don't like it in Florida if you want to build a development. You mean I can't build a condo complex because of a gray panther? And it's always that you know balance. How do we look to other countries and are there other countries that do the same thing we're doing? All of them around the world in one way or the other. Theodore Roosevelt, in my opinion, was the progenitor of the global wildlife protection movement. And uh, I promise you, TR would be, I mean, I don't do what if history, Brian, but if he were alive today, it's like a cover of Time Magazine had lately, he would be fighting, as his great-grandson Theodore Roosevelt IV is right now, to save these great species of the planet that, are, that we're losing quickly. TR loved them. He was not a, a what we call by modern terms, a kind of um, holistic, um, you know, he, he believed in hunting. But he wanted to. He did not believe in well, hunting, so you make a, a species extinct. And so, yes, he cared about snail darts. He cared about uh, butterflies. He cared about wildflowers. He wanted to make sure we had a place for that in modern society. So, whatever people are learning in Zimbabwe about wildlife protection or in Australia, it's born out of Roosevelt's presidency. This sense of global wildlife protection. How often in your research for this book? Did you go away from either a conversation or a place and say, boy, they haven't been doing their job? On the ground, you mean? At the, Just about, at the, I, mean how, I mean, how did you ever get irritated by the attitude that somebody had in research or one of these federal agencies that keep all this stuff or in libraries? Or do you think they, uh, you give them, what kind of a mark do you give I them? I give them an A across the board on being open because not that many people are writing about the history of wildlife protection or the history of conservation, as you might think. And so f for me to come in, having written a number of books and say, I'm interested in your collection, they like it a little less so at Yellowstone or Yosemite because they're, they've been written about a lot. But if you go to like Crater Lake, Stephen Mark out at Crater Lake National Park, every American should go to Crater Lake in Oregon. Spectacular. Um, the, the most dazzling blue color uh, lake in that whole region of southern Oregon, which TR did so much to protect. But he didn't, the, the backstory in a popular publication had never been written about Crater Lake, how it was saved. So they, they were helping me get documents left and right. And so particularly if you pick a site that hasn't been maybe overcovered, I guess you'd say, or overwritten about, they were thrilled just to have somebody, you really care about the history of our park. Many people don't think of history in national parks. They're coming for a camping experience, for hiking. They're less interested in the history of a, a park or a wildlife refuge, where I would try to look at the history of them. What evidence do you have or do you, does your publisher have that this kind of book will sell? Thousand pages. How much is was it? Thirty five dollars a piece. Thirty five bucks, and of course, when you get it online, you know, immediately, I think it's less than that. Um, I think with presidential studies does well, and Theodore Roosevelt's beloved. It's like Washington or Lincoln. Um, so there's, I think, people want to read about a president. Um, I wanted to do the book as thoroughly and accurately as possible. Believe it or not, I had to cut a lot just to get it down to a, uh, I mean hundreds of pages I've cut, just to get it down to a thousand page book because it's that rich of story with that much untapped archival th material. And Brian, I don't write these books on the particularly ones, I, I'm, I'm, not, I w I'm not saying I won't do it in my career, but I wrote this book for future generations because if TR is saying he's saving these parks for generations unborn, I wanted to lay this down as like a track for libraries that every kid will know what happened.
that there were battles fought in this country to save these places. They, they didn't just happen by osmosis. We don't just sort of have a uh, wind cave South Dakota saved for no reason or um, you know, our antiquity sites in South and that people love in New Mexico saved. Each ground site was a battle of the, whether the federal government should have this land or not. And each state has a local hero. And I've tried to focus on, um, on some of those people. So my book, it's not a New York, Washington book per se on TR. It deals a lot, some of the states I focus on are Washington State, Oregon, Hawaii, Alaska, Florida, Mississippi, Louisiana, Oklahoma, Virginia. I took the battle to a lot of these places and I'm hopefully giving a new generation of, of people um, and environmental heroes to look at. The, the beauty of Oregon coast um, was a real battle out there to save it or the islands off of San Francisco. And these are all TR. Last one, Roosevelt in Hawaii, if you grab a map, if viewers look at a map in Hawaii, you see the Hawaiian Islands, look to the west of Hawaii, um, heading towards Asia, Midway. Roosevelt saved all of that for bird sanctuaries. And not just that, when the Japan, he's threatened war with Japan. When Japan, for example, would try to kill birds on that island, Japanese, uh, he threatened war with Japan. In Alaska chain, where he saved seal herds, Roosevelt heard that a group of Japanese um, um, seal hunters came and went on American archipelago rocks and killed American seals and he would not, he was go, get gearing up for war if need be with Japan over seals. So when I was using a title for this book, The Wilderness Warrior, this wasn't just a policy. It's not like doing conservation in Richard Nixon or something. This was a whole other thing. You can't understand the essence of Theodore Roosevelt if you don't understand his relationship with Darwin, with, the, with ornithology and with the big game and forestry of America. Who introduced Roosevelt to Darwin? Uh, that's a good question. Roosevelt's father um, was a, uh, an early reader of Darwin. Uh, TR, I, we don't know the exact moment he discovered Darwin, but we do know when he was um, 14 years old and, and 15, he was over in Egypt and he writes about Darwin as a 14. And in fact, Brian, there is in my book, he draws out how we evolved from the stork. You know, I just told you about the stork. Roosevelt has himself evolving from a stork and draws little pictures of it and shows his brother evolving from apes. Um, the Darwin's Origins of Species came out in 1858 and it didn't really hit America because of the Civil War. By the time Theodore Roosevelt goes to Harvard in 1876 at study at majoring in naturalist studies, Darwin was the rage, and it was a revolution. You know, people talk about somebody being a Marxist ideologue. People became Darwinian ideologues. In fact, I argue in this book that Darwin is the central figure in Roosevelt's intellectual life, and that what some people don't like about Roosevelt's foreign policy, the survival of the fittest, the biggest navy. We are going to be the biggest power um, in the world. That's one side of him. With that's and, and he also erroneously ventured into social Darwinism quite a bit. But on the other flip side of it, domestically, he was spot on right on his understanding of nat natural resource management and how to make sure you save species and entire environments intact. He was a great lover of the prairie. People don't realize Theodore Roosevelt said, I feel most at home on a horse in Kansas and Nebraska than I did not see. He would get terribly seasick. He was our first president to go abroad as president. He went to Panama and then he went to Puerto Rico. You know what he's writing about when he goes down there? Birds. He's taking notes, field notes of the wildlife of Panama. And he saved forest in Puerto Rico and the Philippines. So here's his imperialism. Grab, I'm for the Spanish-American War. I'm president now. We control these properties, and he had a huge concern of protecting ecosystems and species in those places we acquired. It's, it's fascinating. Uh, by the way, why the gloves? Why the white gloves? They make you wear them here. They do at a lot of archival places. Uh, look how, I mean, this is from 1902, and it's the birth of you. This document I'm holding, you could call it, if you wanted, essentially the birth of U.S. Fish and Wildlife right here in that little map, because that's what made Roosevelt start it all with the wildlife protection and saving. Has, has that ever been seen outside of here? 
I, I did have to ask Mark um, here. I don't know. I think it probably online or went something with the Pelican Island site. C-SPAN should go to Pelican Island sometime because U.S. Fish and Wildlife has built this incredible boardwalk down there with each refuge gets like a plank and it goes out with this incredible view. So if you're doing family vacations over the summer to Florida, take the time to go to Pelican Island to this center there because it's, it's really worth it for kids and you're guaranteed to see a rare patch of, of wild Florida. Where is it in Florida? It's close to Vero, the, I, when I would stay there, I would stay in Vero Beach, which is in between, um, you know, St. Augustine, if you like, and um, Palm Beach on that Atlantic coast. Um, but also where uh, the Ding Darling National Wildlife Refuge, and Ding Darling was a young cartoonist who Roosevelt adopted to promote conservation. But Ding Darling um, National Wildlife Refuge, spectacular. And Roosevelt also created the National Forest in, in Florida that links the Atlantic to the Gulf. And if you look on a map, you'll see the big green swatch of National Forest, and that's a heavy manatee area uh, which he preserved also. I've been interviewing you for 15 years at a minimum. Uh, how do you remember all this? Um, I love history. You know that, Brian, about me. I just love it. And, uh, and I have a good memory, I guess, for things that I, I have a, a micro memory when I get into something. But Is it I, photographic memory? I don't know if it's that, but my enthusiasm so high that when I find documents, I'm very excited about it and I'm able to incorporate all that because I like being, this, this really opened my eyes. I had been going, before I wrote this book, to these parks and all. I wasn't thinking about the backstory of how we've got this system. And we're always looking for good news in America. Well, I'll give you a good news story. Look at our incredible park system we've got in this country of wildlife refuges, national forests, national parks. And we did that right. Now we have an obligation to maintain it properly. But how do you, I, you know, I know you remember this because I've talked to you for many times, but how do you, when you're doing your research, keep track of it all? What's your system? Um, well, late historian Stephen Ambrose once told me, abandon chronology at your own peril. Um, and so I realized that events happen day by day. Uh, that there is no, well, this is, you know, today. So you get in a danger if you start more going, switching around dates. So writing-wise, I try to stay chronological because TR lived his life chronologically. Then I would get the dates of all the places that he saved, which I've put as an appendix. Uh, so what, the date he declared something, I have that date. And then, so now I've got TR's biography, the dates of all these places, and I just make sure they intersect properly. And then I say, well, I know this happened. For, I know you know enough about politics. You don't create an Everglades National Park or Grand Canyon if there wasn't some fight or something. Who was the champion that got the winning result? Who is our great Grand Canyon champion? Who was the champion of Yosemite, et cetera? And then I try to bring them into the story. So I'm dealing with two timelines and then a cast of characters. And um, well, where do you put it? Um, I mean, is it on cards? Is it on sheets of paper? Yeah, is sheets of files? paper, notebooks, notebook after notebook, not cards, but um, notebooks, yellow legal pads, spiral notebooks. Uh, I put boxes by states for this book or things. If I also wanted a, a diversity, so I wanted Devil's Tower in Wyoming, so I wanted to make sure we had like, so I'd have a Devil's Tower box. Then I said, well, he went to the Bighorns out in Montana and Wyoming, you know, when he was a young man, so maybe, so I would arrange it in different ways, but I think in terms of, ge maybe more than most humans, I think in terms of geographical place, I'm terribly influenced by my environment where I'm at, so I, which the places I went to are the ones I wanted to write about, and then I just collected everything like a stamp collector. I want everything I can get on uh, the painted, um, you know, the uh, painted desert or on the petrified forest. Roosevelt saved the petrified Forest National Park in Arizona. So you're finished with your manuscript. How do you ensure that it's uh, accurate? Hard. Um, if you, they, I mean, it's always the thing you worry about the most. And I get ill that if you're going to have a mistake in your book and you're bound to, and believe me, you know, somebody will email you or write you a letter, usually nice, and you say, I'm going to correct it in the next edition. But additionally, like in this manuscript, um, I sent chapters to all the people in the parks that helped me. I, Mark Madison would here, I sent him here. My, I sent him the entire manuspect here because he's uh, dealing with all of you as fish and wildlife, but I would send individual Paul Tritech down in Florida, who used to run Pelican Island, now runs Ding Darling. I sent him my Florida chapters, and he then had, 
if he didn't have an answer to something, he had two guys down there look into it. Or, you know, if I went to, um, you know, um, you get the idea. Donald Worster, who wrote the great recent biography of John Muir, is the expert on reclamation projects. And Roosevelt made a lot of mistakes, I think, in building some dams that he shouldn't have, trying to bring electricity to the West. It's controversial, and it's a big part of my book, Reclamation. Well, Donald um, Worcester, a professor at University of Kansas, is our national expert on the arid West. So I would send Donald Worcester my chapters and say, can you give me some feedback? What did I get wrong? Everybody I sent a chapter to found something wrong. Sometimes, a lo you know, four or five wrong. Usually, in this case, I didn't get anything big wrong. It's a word change. I'd say, you know, the winds blew from the southeast, and it can't be the southeast. It's the northeast. And the, that micro thing, and particularly with my ornithology, I'm a bird lover and a, an amateur, but I would send it to Audubon Society specialist on birds to make sure I'm not misidentifying a bird species because they're very particular people in the Audubon world. You have your hand on books, first edition books written by Theodore Roosevelt. Um, how much do you trust those? And did he write them himself? Oh, he wrote like a, he was, a, he was one of the things people ask me, oh, how do you write so much? I mean, you did this and you're teaching. I'm nothing compared to Theodore Roosevelt. This guy was doing five times more while he was running the country. He was writing books at a regular interval. This book here, uh, is his letters to his children and um, it's, a, it's a, a, a wonderful book because he would write them a lot like look here's a letter to his children just on the love of flowers TR on flowers later in his life towards the end of his life he became a wildflower expert look at this one I'm just randomly opening this Puerto Rican scenery I just told you when he went down there he's not writing home he's writing all about the you know, there are vines with masses of brilliant purple and pink flowers and others with masses like white flowers. You know, he goes on and on and on and on. Now, have you read all, all of his yes. books? How this, many books did he write? Um, well, it depends because there are so many edited versions of them. Like, people would take an article and then they'd call it a book. And then there's massive sets, Brian, of 20 volume, the memorial editions of TR. But he wrote what I would call Roosevelt books, you know, over 30 that are his own uh, titles and really some people say over 50 if you're take you know, if he would give a speech people would make it into a book you know like he didn't make the book letters to my children it's Roosevelt's writing but it was done later now one one I've read this somewhere I might have even asked you about this years ago but can it be true that he read a book a day yes now, I mean how could you though? how could you be the president of the United States write books go all over the world all the time fight the world and all the problems he had be the big antitruster uh, and, and read a book a day. He was a phenom. Um, his mind went at such a rapid pace and I've noticed that people that read a lot read, read quicker because he knew how to read and he'd read all the classics. When, even when he was in the woods he'd bring called the pigskin editions and he would bring his favorite classics. Uh, he would read and, and memorize them and it informs everything he did but his for reading that what was unique about him in the present is he focused on naval history, military history, and wildlife conservation, forestry. How much of the Navy experience that he had? Well, he wrote, um, you know, his first book he wrote at Harvard is called The, the Summer Birds of the Adirondacks. And he wrote about birds in, in New York. His second big book became The Naval War of 1812, which made him the top Mahanian kind of naval strategist, and he became an assistant secretary of the Navy. So he would juggle Navy with this sort of Western hunting, um, like this Boone and Crockett club with the buffalo on the top. Um, Roosevelt knew everything. I, what I'd like people to understand is, as president, Roosevelt didn't just know about, say, gray wolves or cougars. He was the world's authority on them in, in a science way. And George Bird Grinnell, who's an under, undersung hero of America, co-founded the Boone and Crockett Club with Roosevelt, and it was specifically formed in the 18, late 1880s out of New York to save the big game of America, to save buffalo, antelope, deer, caribou from being exterminated. And they would commission articles, and Roosevelt would write them, see, this one's on elk, you could just turn. And these are great old books that Roosevelt got very involved in bringing out these Boone and Crockett Club books and it was about gentlemen hunters. I mean, they were, they were working to save animals, to shoot animals. Um, and people have problems with that some today, but I, I, it was the hunters of America 
that really formed the early conservation movement. It was done by Field and um, um, you know, Field, Field, Field and Forest magazine and these what became Field and Stream magazine, but all of those um, sporting journals um, that started putting in uh, that you've got to have bag limits. You've got to put a fish back if it has eggs. You know, you've got to not shoot a doe. We take this for granted now. But Roosevelt was in, in George Bird Grinnell, so Professor John Riger, for example, who's the Grinnell Scholar at Univers Ohio University Chillicothe. Um, he proofread my chapters on Grinnell because George Bird Grinnell is the other very important figure in my book. Roosevelt and, and Grinnell was the American authority on game. Uh, last couple of questions. Uh, who pays for all your travel to all these sites and all this research done? Is that part mm -hmm. of what the publisher promises you? Yeah, they give you an advance and then I squander it on my travel and so I make no money and therefore I have to stay as a professor. This book on Theodore Roosevelt was very expensive for me. Do you have any idea what it cost you? I don't, you know, and I don't, I don't lavish, I mean, I fly a, economy, I rent the cheapest car I can and I stay at the, a modest inn when I go to these places, but it nevertheless, since I've been really doing it since, uh, the 90s, you know, it, it, it adds up to the point where you're wondering from an, a lifestyle point of view, it probably doesn't add up to a, do a book of this nature. But once you do a big, serious, heavily footnoted research book like this, my next book I could do something that I can do at a home without so much travel. La last question, how did you know that it was over? This book was finished, what was the last moment? Um, I ended this book, uh, I, I wrote the chapters already on his ex-presidency, but I didn't want to bring the focus away to Africa and Brazil because my book subtitle is about America and TR's America. So I end the book in March of 1909 when he's leaving the White House so the reader could see here's what this man accomplished on behalf of, of, um, uh, of America from 1901 to 1909. So I micro do his whole life and I end the book in 1909 and I'm doing my next volume is going to do on how Roosevelt influenced a whole new generation, including young Franklin Roosevelt, who got very interested in conservation and started planting trees all over and was trying to be like Teddy Roosevelt. And uh, so FDR and Eleanor Roosevelt got very involved in conservation, but then people like Aldo Leopold, Ding Darling, et cetera. So I'm doing another volume. I'm planning on going from, this book begins in 1858, TR's birth in New York, and I'm eventually going to end with the era of global warming, uh, the time where we have right now, and, and, and march us through in a multiple volume history. Thank you, uh, Professor Brinkley. Brian, thank you. From a history standpoint, where did you find the different artifacts that you have and the material? Did you have to bring them somewhere else to here? That's a really good question. Actually, most of the materials we have have come off refuges or fish hatcheries actually from the field. Almost everything in our archive is donated by former employees or by field offices. So, so these historic things that uh, Doug Brinkley's written about and so on, they were in garages, basements, attics. Uh, they were suffering from all sorts of environmental deterioration and so on and once we opened an archive we basically filled up the archive in 10 years with these historic objects so researchers could use them so the public could see them and so we could teach with them. Something that motivates us Brian on that is Rachel Carson is our most famous employee. Uh, when Rachel Carson re retired from the Fish and Wildlife Service much of her papers and materials went into the incinerator and we will never let that happen <laughs> hope, again. Yeah, yeah. Who, who put them in the incinerator? They they just saw no value in it back then. Put Rachel Carson in historic perspective. Sure, it's very easy. You just talk to Douglas Brinkley. Easily, Theodore Roosevelt is our starting point for the American conservation movement. Rachel Carson plays the same role, really, with uh, what we call the American environmental movement, uh, which has different concerns than Roosevelt had. 
a little more holistic concerns, beginning of concerns about toxins and pollutants, uh, beginning of concerns for endangered species, preserving all species, even things that might have been pests or predators. So she's kind of a touch point beginning in 1962 with Silent Spring for the environmental movement. That's when that begins. And I think really 1901 with Theodore Roosevelt's presidency is where the conservation movement begins. You told me earlier that you have a son named Theodore. Yeah. <laughs> any, uh, any relationship to Theodore Roosevelt? Yeah, it's, it's no coincidence. My four-year-old's name is uh, Theodore, and uh, he's named partially in honor of Theodore Roosevelt because uh, Theodore Roosevelt has so many admirable qualities. He loved nature. I hope my Theodore loves nature. Uh, he had exuberant energy. Definitely my four-year-old uh, exhibits that in spades. And uh, he made a difference, and everybody hopes that for their kids. Steve Chase, uh, one of the things I picked up from being here is that you have a facility with rooms to rent, I mean, a uh, facility that people can come in and uh, put on a conference and all that. How does that relate to the outside world, and can just the average company or organization rent it? Well, the important thing to remember about this place is it's a center for conservation leadership, and that doesn't only mean the federal government. That means everybody involved in conservation, whether it be uh, the feds, state government, not uh, non-government groups, or corporations. And we think the only way to address our conservation challenges in the future is through partnerships across all those sectors. So the NCTC is open. Uh, for people to come here from any sector to talk about conservation and to try to figure out solutions to the challenges that we face. But you can't just walk in the front door. No, not open to the public, but um, any anyone that's interested in coming out and doing some research in our archive, we're happy to have you out. And you say anyone, do you have to have credentials to be a researcher? No, we, the archive is open to the American public, but most people that come because it's a serious archive our researchers, a lot of graduate students, a lot of filmmakers, a lot of um, historical outlets on, on cable and so on have used us. We've worked with the Sasonian. We've even worked with Walt Disney World of all places. Um, so we, we, we uh, serve a broad cross section of the public. Fit this in to the American government structure. How does, who, who, who's the boss of the boss of the boss of this kind of a place? Okay. Well, we work for the U.S. Department of the Interior. So o overall, uh, it's the Secretary of the Interior, and above that, it's the President of the United States. So we work for whatever administration is currently there. What's the budget for an operation like this for a year? Uh, our budget's uh, a little more than $23 million a year, and that gives us um, almost 600 events a year and more than 15,000 people coming through our programs. And in history, how much are we spending on this kind of effort compared to, say, what it was 50 years ago? Uh, I don't think we were spending much money at all on history 50 years ago. In fact, uh, I'm the first historian we've had for the Fish and Wildlife Service, and I was hired 10 years ago. So, you know, basically 12 years ago, we didn't have an archive, we didn't have a historian, we didn't have a history program. Uh, in the last 12 years, we've created a history program. We still run really tight. We don't spend a lot of money purchasing artifacts or anything. We basically manage an archive, manage a museum, and, and manage uh, a couple personnel, and, and that's it. So if both of you could have whatever you wanted to make all this better, what would you, what would you ask for? You go first. <laughs> what, would I, what I would ask for would be for the, uh, uh, the public, the general public in the U.S., to all know who the Fish and Wildlife Service is, because we have really dedicated folks to do uh, great work for critters and for the American people, and a lot of people don't even know we exist. How many different places are there around the United States we, that come under this umbrella? We have about 800 field stations, and we manage 150 million acres. Mark Madison, what would you wish for? Uh, two things. I wish everybody would think about the environment when they study history because it, it transforms things from the Dust Bowl to DDT. But also, I wish everybody would go out and enjoy the environment on a park or a refuge. I think that's the way we get our constituency is people going out and enjoying themselves in nature and places like this. Um, that's really where our future lies. Gentlemen, thank you. Thank, thank you. you.
Next week on Q&A, author Walter Kern 